So my name is Stephen Fiala, and I'm one of the tobacco research analysts for the Health Promotion Chronic Disease Prevention section of the Public Health Division. And I'm Kim LaCroix. I'm a policy specialist in the same section. And today we're going to be talking about flavored tobacco. Um, it's sweet, it's cheap, and it's available at a store near you. Actually, isn't that exciting? So our objectives for the day are to talk about the what. So what is the tobacco retail environment and how does flavored tobacco fit into that retail environment? The so what, why do we care about flavored tobacco? And the now what, what are we doing about flavored tobacco use in Oregon? And before we get into flavored tobacco specifically, we're gonna back up a bit and touch on tobacco use in general. We wanted to acknowledge that tobacco use is still the leading cause of preventable death in Oregon and the United States. So it's estimated that about 7,000 people a year in Oregon die from tobacco use. So it's the leading cause of death. And as a tobacco prevention program, we focus on the best practices for reducing tobacco use and reducing the morbidity and mortality associated with tobacco use. So some of these best practices include uh, sustained funding for a comprehensive tobacco prevention education program, uh, increasing the price of tobacco, because as the price increases, tobacco use decreases. It's one of the most effective interventions to reduce tobacco use. <clears throat> Establishing 100% smoke-free and tobacco-free places. Uh, so an example of this is the Indoor Clean Air Act that bans smoking in all workplaces in Oregon. Ensuring that those who want to quit smoking have access to evidence-based cessation tools, like, like the gum. And that we're also, as a program, implementing hard-hitting media campaigns that counter all of the tobacco industry's advertising. So these are all the component, components of a comprehensive tobacco prevention education. Um, and it seems that these best practices are working. So we see here that over time, tobacco use is decreasing, both in Oregon and the US. This graph in particular is cigarette consumption, but we're seeing similar declines across product types. So we appear to be doing our job. And uh, because we are having success in all of these best practice areas that we just went over, um, we're able as a program to start work on the next hopefully last frontier in tobacco control. And what is that? Oops, preview. Uh, that is the tobacco retail environment. So the last frontier in tobacco control. So what is the tobacco retail environment? So you might think of this environment as convenience stores at gas stations. Uh, you might think of it as standalone convenience stores. 7-Eleven is actually the uh, largest tobacco retailer in the country, according to a recently released study. Um, you might think of a traditional tobacco shop, and you might think of beer, wine, and liquor stores that sell tobacco. But we need to keep in mind that the retail environment is any place that sells tobacco. So this includes your grocery stores, your wholesalers like Costco, uh, pharmacies, Walgreens is the number two tobacco retailer in the country, and CVS, was number three, but as we all know, right, um, they stopped selling tobacco products and even renamed themselves CVS Health to reflect this shift in their model. And the dollar stores have expressed interest in selling tobacco products. And for certain products that we'll be talking about a little bit later, like electronic cigarettes, um, you'll find these in the mall in kiosks. And this is a picture from Lloyd Center Mall, which is just blocks away, so you could take a trip to this kiosk. Um, so all of these places make up the tobacco retail environment. Um, and as we're thinking about policy work in this environment, uh, we think about uh, price, placement, and promotion of the products. Uh, but for today, we're going to focus on product availability, and specifically flavored tobacco product availability. All right, so um, you might have thought that we have the tobacco problem under control, but that is definitely not true. The tobacco industry is alive and well, and they are definitely taking advantage of loopholes that are in uh, different types of legislation. 
So um, it's important as we delve into the flavored tobacco issue that you understand a little bit of the uh, historical context in some of the current regulations. So uh, in 2009, our president, Barack Obama, signed the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. This was landmark legislation that did many things, such as grant the FDA authority to regulate tobacco products. Um, but one of the things that it did related to flavored tobacco products is that it banned characterizing flavors in cigarettes. So. That's wonderful, except there's many loopholes. Um, menthol is still allowed to be in cigarettes. Um, it's exempted from this legislation. And other tobacco products are still allowed to be flavored. So um, up here in the left-hand corner is a picture of flavored snuff or chew tobacco. Um, in the middle, we have e-liquids that come in a variety of flavors. On the far right is flavored little cigars. Far left are some Swisher Sweets, which are also flavored. Um, and you have some cool menthol cigarettes and um, flavored hookah or shisha is also available. And the industry um, has recognized in their own um, publications, this is a convenience store newsletter, um, that the flavored tobacco products are um, a great market opportunity and they're really pushing for more shelf space to sell flavored tobacco. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the usual suspects. Did anyone get this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about the usual suspects in flavored tobacco. So the products that tend to have flavorings. Um, and Kim touched on some, and we're gonna go a little bit deeper. So first we're gonna start with some of the smokeless products and just go over what they are, because a lot of people aren't aware of all these products. Uh, so we have snuff, which is just shredded tobacco. It comes in moist or dry form. You have chewing tobacco, which is tobacco leaf in a plug or a twist form. And then a relatively new product is snoofs, which is a spitless, smokeless tobacco. It's still shredded in a pouch. It's still sticking under your tongue. Um, and so in terms of flavor, we're gonna focus on snuff, and Kim showed a screenshot of this already, but just to show you the flavor availability of these products, they come in fruit flavors like cherry and apple and peach, some citrus, some berries, some vanilla, um, so there are quite a few flavors available for snuff. And now we're gonna get into combustible tobacco products, or the ones that you light on fire and inhale. So here we have large cigars, we have little cigars and cigarillos, which are functionally and the same uh, size and shape as cigarettes, which is important. Uh, and we also have hookah tobacco, as Kim mentioned, which is shredded tobacco that's typically combined with molasses and flavoring. And so we saw in snuff, we had a few flavor options, but now we're getting into little cigars and we see the flavor availability expanding a little. So we have the fruit, um, and we have the menthol still, but now we're getting wine, we're getting flavors like Tropical Fusion. There was one called Island Madness that I could not find a picture for, so that's not on there. Um, but we see from snuff moving into little cigars that we're getting even more flavors. And now we're getting into hookah tobacco, and we're gonna see the same thing, where we're having um, an expanding option for flavors. Um, and we have uh, the fruit flavors and the citrus flavors that we saw before, but now we're getting some like caramel apple, blueberry pancake, cotton candy, and gingerbread. Um, and we're starting to see ones that might appeal more to youth, which we're gonna talk about more later. Um, and then we're also seeing ones that have alcohol drink flavors and some curious ones like Scooby Snacks. Not sure what that's going to taste like, um, but probably still is appealing to a younger demographic. And gummy bears, which are my favorite candy. Okay, and the next product we're going to talk about is electronic cigarettes. And uh, we include electronic cigarettes into this overall category of tobacco products because the liquid that goes in them contains nicotine, which is derived from tobacco, and nicotine is the addictive substance in tobacco. So we as a program combine these into the one tobacco product category. Um, and this is a diagram of an e-cigarette, and the liquid nicotine goes into 
the capsule portion. There's a device that heats it to the point where it vaporizes the liquid nicotine and then the user inhales it. Uh, and then on the right, those are little bottles of liquid nicotine. Um, and they come in multi-use forms and also disposable forms. And I think most of the disposable forms have about 300 puffs per cigarette. Um, so that's electronic cigarettes. Um, and looking at one of the most well-known and advertised brands of electronic cigarettes, Blue, uh, we see some si similar flavor options to maybe snuff and little cigars with the cherry and coffee and even some alcohol flavored options. Um, but once we get into the e-liquid products, um, the ability to customize, you just see an explosion of flavor options. Um, and so we're seeing cotton candy, snickerdoodle, banana split, still probably appealing to youth. Um, and then interestingly, uh, we're also seeing um, e-liquid manufacturers take advantage of brands that are already well established and appeal to kids. So there's Skittles, there's Fruity Pebbles, Mountain Dew, so really well established soda, candy, and cereal brands. And um, the explosion of flavors available for electronic cigarettes was highlighted in a recent article in the New York Times. So they called it an arms race for these exotic vapor flavors. And in that, they note that more than 7,000 flavors are now available, and nearly 250 more are being introduced every month. And this is just a screenshot of some of the options. And so, um, we see across these product types that there are many flavors available. As we move from snuff to little cigars, to hookah, to e-cigs, we see an expanding availability of flavors, but across all of these products we're talking about, there are flavors available. Oh, Stu, what's tiger's blood? <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. We didn't think that one sounded particularly appealing, but, um, but certainly banana split. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Something, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. So we're going to spend a little bit more time um, talking about electronic cigarettes because unlike the other tobacco products, electronic cigarettes are currently completely unregulated. So not only are there no restrictions on flavors, uh, there's no marketing or advertising restrictions, and industry has taken full advantage of this. Um, you may have seen electronic cigarettes advertised on commercials, in magazines, on billboards. It's everywhere. Uh, electronic cigarettes aren't taxed like other um, tobacco products, especially cigarettes, and they don't come in child-resistant packaging, and this has resulted in kids getting their hands on the nicotine cartridges and some reports to the poison control centers. Of the things that the FDA is considering regulating related to electronic cigarettes, um, sampling and sales to minors are really the only um, two things that are, uh, you know, have a little bit of potential to make a difference. Um, sampling, uh, in their new proposed rules, they might ban um, the sampling of electronic cigarettes and they might restrict sales for minors. However, we know that Restricting sales to minors in and of itself is not really an effective policy solution. Part of the reason there's not very many or no regulations on electronic cigarettes is because they're such a new product and um, a, a reason that's often cited is because there's many things we don't know about them. However, there are more knowns than there are unknowns about electronic cigarettes. We know that they're addictive. We know that they contain nicotine, which is an extremely addictive substance. We know they're a starter for nicotine addiction. Um, CDC last week just released a study that showed that youth who use electronic cigarettes are two times more likely to report that they intend to use regular cigarettes. We know that they're not approved or regulated by the FDA yet. We know that the industry is marketing them. And we know that all of these things is undermining our progress that we've made on social norms related to tobacco use over the last 50 years. However, it is important to recognize that there are some things that we don't know at this time. We don't know the long-term health impact, and we don't know if they're a successful or effective tool to helping people quit. We do know that the industry is um, using some old tricks to sell their new stick. Um, they're borrowing 
pages from the tobacco industry, um, doc, or what they used in the 50s and 60s. They're using celebrities. This is Jenny McCarthy, who's advertising a popular product called Blue. Um, they're uh, using that sex appeal and that rebelliousness. And of course, they're coming in hundreds of kid-friendly flavors. And it's working, right? Mm -hmm. um, just two years ago, in 2012, electronic cigarette sales were $500 million. And one year later, in 2013, it's $1.7 billion. So it'll be interesting to see what it is in 2014. And they're available everywhere. Um, this is a picture from um, a convenience store um, in Portland. It was actually given to me by um, Dr. Pienko, who I think just walked in. He's a professor at PSU um, in the chemistry department who studies the flavor chemicals in tobacco products. And he's doing a study on electronic cigarettes. And this just shows you the myriad of flavors available in convenience stores. And there's also a proliferation of vape shops, which um, sell just electronic cigarettes and allow their use indoors, similar to hookahs, hookah shops. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, this it was taken in Southeast Portland. And as I mentioned before, there's no regulations on the manufacturing of electronic cigarettes or their liquids. So this is a van. I know the picture is kind of hard to see, but um, it says e-cig lady, and she's selling flavored liquids. <laughs> so um, it's unclear if she's mixing them in her van or <laughs> what her <laughs> what her real uh, business venture is, but um, the fact is she's selling e-liquids out of her van. <laughs> okay, uh, so we talked about all of the available flavors across these product types, the non-cigarette products, uh, but why do we care? So we're getting into the so why. Why do we care that tobacco products are flavored? So one of the primary reasons we care is because it appeals to youth and it affects youth tobacco use initiation. So um, Kim mentioned the 2009 Tobacco Control Act that President Obama signed. Um, and when the FDA banned characterizing flavors in cigarettes in their press release, they wrote, flavored cigarettes are a gateway for many children and young adults to become regular smokers. So this gateway concept associated with flavors is really important. And we know that nearly 90% of adult cigarette smokers start before the age of 18. So again, if flavors act as a gateway for youth initiation of tobacco, and then we know that the vast majority of those who start using tobacco in their youth continue into adulthood, continue into lifelong addiction to nicotine, the flavor as a gateway is really important. And something else that was interesting, in the last Surgeon General's report, um, they acknowledge that kids are just easier to addict to tobacco products, and it's because their developing brains are mo more vulnerable to nicotine. So you're taking a flavored product that's appealing to kids, and they're already more likely to become addicted to the product because of the developing brain. And then once they are an established tobacco user as youth, they, the vast majority are likely to continue that into adulthood, um, and experience all the associated morbidity and mortality with long-term tobacco use. So uh, how exactly does flavor play a role in this tobacco use initiation? What are the, some of the components of flavor that, that lead to this? So this one seems obvious, but I just wanted to point it out. <laughs> flavored tobacco is flavored, yes? So given the choice between a traditional tobacco product uh, that tastes like tobacco, that's harsh, that smells harsh and tastes harsh. Um, if the alternative is caramel apple, Mountain Dew, gingerbread, or peach, just the very nature of being flavored is going to appeal to a child rather than trying the harsh regular tobacco product. So flavored tobacco is flavored. And a quick pop quiz in your activity. Uh, what do Lifesavers, Kool-Aid, Jolly Ranchers, and Flavored Little Cigars have in common? You get two seconds. Yeah, they're flavored and they use the same chemicals for their flavoring. So, um, 
and mention the study by the good doctor that's with us today. Um, and this is a visual from his letter published in New England Journal of Medicine, and it's showing the chemical composition of cherry flavoring. And the takeaway is, is that it's the same chemicals that are used to flavor cherry lifesavers, Jolly Ranchers, Kool-Aid, are, are the same ones that are being used in Swisher Sweets and Snuff. And so the point here is that these are literally uh, candy-flavored tobacco products. And that's pretty appealing to someone who's young. And some of them even say candy on their label, which I think is amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, and because they're flavored, um, they taste better and they smell better. Um, and we know because they taste better and they smell better that there's a lower perceived harm that youth have of these products that are flavored. And when youth have a lower perceived harm of anything, they're, they're more likely to do it. So the flavored components of these products are, are reducing that perceived harm. And then menthol specifically actually literally makes it easier to smoke. So menthol is the primary component in Icy Hot that numbs your muscles. And so it's doing the same thing essentially to the throat. It's numbing the throat and making it easier to smoke that product, to use it. So there's a lower perceived harm and then just literally making it easier to use the product. Right, so um, it's important to keep in mind that menthol is a flavor, and um, as I mentioned before, it's still allowed in cigarettes, and um, it's also flavoring uh, little cigars and um, electronic cigarettes. And we're concerned about menthol because long-term studies have <coughs> demonstrated that menthol is associated with an increase of youth initiation and decreased um, cessation success. And although most of our presentation has had a youth focus, menthol is really an equity issue. Um, the tobacco industry has a long history of developing and marketing mentholated brands to the African American community. And um, this is proven in some tobacco industry documents that are um, available and uh, have some pretty alarming quotations from industry executives. This is just another example of some of the advertisements that the industry um, has uh, done to target uh, African Americans. And although these are updated, um, they clearly show the targeting. And uh, one thing that we're concerned about with menthol is um, the fact that the two biggest brands, Cool and Newport, have recently merged. Um, this is the number two and three tobacco companies that make these products, and it's really just expanding the reach for menthol products. And um, currently, they have about a 28% market share, but menthol cigarettes are decreasing sales at a lower rate than regular cigarettes. Um, so it's something to keep an eye on, it's something to definitely be concerned about. Um, so there's a loophole with menthol cigarettes, and there's also um, a loophole with the price of flavored tobacco. So not only is it sweet, but it's also cheap. Um, in the Tobacco Control Act that I mentioned, um, it required cigarettes to be sold in packs of 20, um, but other tobacco products, like little cigars, don't have that requirement. So they can be sold as singles in packs of five, um, and they can be sold for very, which selling them as singles or in low amounts brings down the price and makes it more appealing to youth, to price sensitive youth. Um, and so they can be sold as low or probably even lower than 89 cents, which is about the price of a Snickers candy bar. It might taste the same. <laughs> it might taste the same. <laughs> so you can buy one at a time, just like you would buy one Snickers bar at a time. And lowering the price, uh, we know it impacts um, use, so in initiation and prevalence. Um, so increasing price, uh, we know is one of the most effective interventions for decreasing tobacco use. Um, another loophole is that flavored tobacco, it can be advertised. Um, there's many restrictions on the advertising of cigarettes. There's not nearly as many restrictions on other tobacco products, and especially electronic cigarettes. So this is an example of snuff. Um, as you can see, uh, 
their marketing um, with the sex appeal, the rebelliousness, and the flavor. So it's coming in um, an apple blend. Um, use of celebrities for electronic cigarettes. And this is pretty disturbing. Um, this is showing, because of the lack of regulations on electronic cigarettes, um, they're advertised on youth-centric TV stations, um, such as MTV, VH1, ABC Family, and um, even more disturbingly, it's advertised on very youth-centric TV shows, like Futurama. Okay. Um, so in addition to being advertised um, in magazines and on television, and particularly youth-centric television, uh, they're also heavily promoted in the retail environment. Uh, and this is concerning because we know about 70% of teens shop at convenience stores at least once a week. Uh, so they're in these environments a lot, and they're being bombarded with these displays and these advertisements for these flavored tobacco products. Uh, and these actually are pictures from uh, tobacco retail assessments that each county in Oregon um, undertook. So these are local pictures. Um, and we see on the left a display for electronic cigarette liquid. Of course, the banana, apple, and cherry flavors. Um, and then on the right, we see that picture again of a single flavored little cigar that's only 89 cents. Um, so in addition to promoting the displays and the ads in general of the flavored products, it's where these products are being placed in this environment. So that e-liquid display on the left is actually right next to, I don't know if you can make it out, the Candy Crush candy. It's right next to the bubble gum. It's right next to the Dove bars. Uh, so they're locating these flavored tobacco products that already appeal to kids next to other items in the store that also appeal to kids, like toys, candy, and gum. And they're also really low displays, so probably at the line of sight of a kid. And these are just some more pictures. So we have the little cigars next to the Hershey's display. The one on the right is my favorite, um, for all the wrong reasons because it shows the little cigars uh, right next to the Mike and Ike's and the Snickers, and you can't really tell them apart at all. And that's the point. The point is, is that they're already flavored products that appeal, and they're being associated with other flavored products that appeal to kids. And they're manufactured in many ways to look like candy, to look like products that already appeal to you. So we have the advertising, the display of them, and then just the manufacturing of them to look like these candy products. Okay, so we went over how does flavor play a role in youth tobacco use initiation, and we focused on the fact that it's sweet. So it's sweet, so it's more likely to appeal to kids. Um, it's lowering the perceived harm leading to use. We talked about how it's cheap, we know that youth are really price sensitive, so the lower you can make the price of a product, the more likely they are to choose that product, like the single flavored little cigar for lower than a Snickers bar. And they're advertised. So this, the marketing restrictions that apply to cigarettes, all of them don't apply to the other tobacco products. So they have more leeway in advertising, which is why you see them in magazines, television, um, etc. So, um, we see that they're sweet, they're cheap, they're advertised, more likely to appeal to youth. Are we seeing this reflected in some of our organ data? Uh, so this is a bar graph showing on the blue bar, cigarette use. Um, the orange bar is non-cigarette use. So that's all, the other, all of the other products we've been talking about combined. So all those non-cigarette tobacco products that can be and tend to be flavored. Um, and we see it among 8th grade, 11th grade, and adults moving down. And we do notice that among youth, the orange bar is longer. So the prevalence of non-cigarette tobacco product use is higher than cigarette use among youth. And then when we move down to adults, uh, we see that it's the opposite. We see that now the blue bar is longer than the orange bar. So the prevalence of cigarette use is higher than the prevalence of non-cigarette tobacco use. Um, and so we see that in our local data, and then as Kim mentioned, we're also seeing studies coming out of CDC that point to the gateway of these flavored products leading to eventual addiction to 
um, hard, more hardcore products like cigarettes. So the fact that the youth who used electronic cigarettes being nearly twice as likely to indicate that they will try conventional cigarettes, um, more and more evidence that they can be, serve as a gateway to harder products. All right, so, so far we've talked about the what, what is the problem, so what, why do we care, now I'm going to talk about the now what, what can we do about it. So um, I'm going to talk about some policy options, um, some examples from other places around the country, and then some local efforts around Oregon. So, um, on the East Coast, uh, New York City and Providence, Rhode Island have successfully prohibited the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Um, the state of Maine has prohibited the sale of flavored cigars. And most recently, um, the city of Chicago has prohibited the sale of menthol cigarettes within 500 feet of schools. So um, beyond uh, flavored sales restrictions, um, there's a couple other policy options, uh, such as a concept um, known as tax, tax parity. Uh, so I talked throughout the whole presentation about the many loopholes. Well, this exists with prices as well. Um, the prices for cigarettes, uh, or the taxes for cigarettes are, are not the same as for other tobacco products. Um, as I mentioned before, um, cigarettes have to come in packs of 20 or more. Um, this is not the case with um, singles or with um, little cigars. They're allowed to be sold as singles, doubles, packs of five. Um, so that brings down the price. Uh, so one policy option is to have minimum pack size, so requiring um, little cigars to be sold in packs of 20, for example. And uh, the tobacco industry does whatever it can to uh, lower the price. So um, those taxes that are effective at uh, reducing initiation and prevalence, um, they deliberately target coupons um, that help lower the price for um, all tobacco products and especially flavored tobacco products. So one policy option is to ban the redemption of coupons. Um, this has also been success. This has been done in Providence, Rhode Island, and um, it's one of the an effective intervention because it helps lower the price. Hey, yes. Is that a teenager on a roller coaster? <laughs> it's, a, it's at my cube. If you want to come by and look at it, the front of it is two teenagers jumping in the air because they're so excited about their discount. So again, the rebelliousness. I'm sure they're. Looking at, but, you know, looking people. Thought they did. Too. So um, a coupon ban or coupon redemption ban is another policy option. So um, what's happening across Oregon? Uh, as Stephen mentioned, um, all 36 counties in Oregon um, have a tobacco prevention education program and they are finishing up completing their tobacco retail assessment. So um, they're looking broadly at the tobacco retail environment, at things like price, what products are available, what kinds of promotion is available, and um, they're looking specifically at flavors as well. This is uh, some results from one Oregon county. Um, nearly all of the tobacco retailers assessed in this county sold flavored tobacco products. So you can see the ubiquity of flavored tobacco. Um, nearly, or half of them, were displayed at three feet or below, so that's at the eye level of a child. And about a little over a third of them were displayed within 12 inches of toys and candy. And, so like I said, they're also assessing the price of um, products available, and this is the average retail price of a single flavored cigar in this county. Uh, and this slide here, this is um, an example from Hood River County. So in Hood River, they have a health media club, and um, that TPAP coordinator engaged their youth to help complete the tobacco retail assessments. And um, one of the byproducts of engaging youth was just some of their 
um, candid comments and observations about how the tobacco industry is deliberately marketing to them. So um, one member of that health media club said, um, was talking about how the bright, shiny packaging um, appeals to her niece. And her niece is really little, she's about six years old, I think, and couldn't really read, and was asking um, her cousin, you know, what is that? And she had to say, well, that's tobacco. So um, as Steve mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we know what works for tobacco control, and one of those uh, one of the important components is a hard-hitting media campaign. So I just wanted to show to you today um, what we've been working on from a media standpoint. So this is a screenshot of our Smoke-Free Oregon website. So it's been revamped. I encourage you all to visit it. It's a great website. It helps tell the story of um, how the tobacco industry um, I had, the, it tells a, a story of the epidemic of the tobacco problem and the tobacco industry's involvement, and it's a way to engage um, people who visit the site, so community members and also decision makers. So we're in many media channels. One of them is social media. So this is an example of some of the social media posts that are on our Facebook page. So um, comprehensive. You know, flavored tobacco is one component of comprehensive tobacco control. So you can see there are some examples of other um, areas of tobacco control that are addressed through our social media. So the one in the middle at the top is celebrating the fact that all Oregon state parks are now smoke free. Yay. Um, and uh, you might have heard that there's some effort to make um, peach or peaches <laughs> um, smoke free as well. So that's one media channel. Um, another one is print media. Um, on the left here is one of our local heroes from Hood River. His name is Butch. He is a gas station owner uh, who refuses to sell tobacco products at his Chevron station. And then on the right, um, again, just celebrating the fact that all Oregon State Parks are smoke free. So these are examples um, in print media, like magazines. Uh, we're making an effort to reach out and find local heroes in all Oregon counties. Um, on the top left is a pharmacist in Tillamook County, and he has not sold tobacco products in his pharmacy since 1964. Mm -hmm. Anyone know why that date is of significance? Surgeon First Surgeon General report. So when he saw that report, he thought it didn't make sense to sell a product that when used as directed will kill. And then again, um, on the bottom right is the Health Media Club. They're also one of our local heroes. Other efforts that we're involved with are community engagement. So you might have seen um, tobacco candy jars placed around the room. You have to so. open it to get the full effect. <laughs> um, this is a great visual that uh, we've been using and local um, TPEP coordinators have been using to demonstrate the problem of flavored tobacco. So um, it shows that you can't really tell the difference <laughs> between candy and flavored tobacco. Um, and you can open it up and you can see how it smells more appealing than regular tobacco. It smells sweet. It's packaged to look like candy. So, um, so they, uh, we've been sharing these with decision makers um, and media to raise awareness about flavored tobacco. Another way uh, to get involved is th uh, through something called What's for Sale in Your Neighborhood. It's a community walk where uh, you go to various convenience stores uh, with either elected officials or interested community members um, to show them what's available for sale. Uh, many people, especially elected officials, may not uh, go to a typical convenience store, so this might be a really eye-opening experience for them. Um, and it, just walking in clearly demonstrates all of the problems uh, with tobacco in the retail environment, and especially flavored tobacco, um, which we've 
talked about many times, but it'll, it's clear, it's one thing to just go in there and see it for yourself, you know, to actually see the products displayed at a child's eye level in all these bright, shiny packages. So, um, wanted to keep in mind that we know that uh, a hard hitting media campaign is one component of comprehensive tobacco control. And um, all of those efforts, um, the media campaign and um, all the other efforts have led to um, some interest from decision makers. So uh, recently, I think it was back in June, um, Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley hosted an event in Portland to raise awareness about um, flavored tobacco and to also call upon the FDA to issue um, strong regulations for electronic cigarettes. Um, just last month, 28 attorney generals submitted letters to the FDA calling for them to ban flavors in electronic cigarettes. And looking forward to the next legislative session, there's the possibility of a legislative concept to ban the sale of flavored tobacco. So, it's been a long presentation, but there's three things <laughs> that I want all of you to walk away from today with. And that's understanding that flavored tobacco is sweet, <laughs> it's cheap, and it's marketed, and all of those things make it more appealing to youth. 